Religion can be confusing. Just to drive down the street and we see church after church. How do we choose? How can we find the truth? Truth for the World can help you. Visit truthfortheworld.org for biblical answers to your questions. No man-made doctrines, no opinions, just straight Bible teaching. Articles, audio files, television programs, and educational courses, all free and available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear. On our program today, we're going to look at fear. So don't be afraid. It's actually going to be a good program. Open your Bibles with me now, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Luke, chapter 12, we're going to be reading verses 4 and 5. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. In some places the Bible tells us to fear, such as in these verses. But in other places it tells us not to fear. If we go down to verse 7 of this very same chapter, Luke chapter 12, we read the following, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than the sparrows. How can the Bible say to fear in one place, but not to fear in another place? What is the Bible talking about, and what does the Bible mean when it says these things? We're going to look at the following three ideas. Number one, the different types of fear. Number two, a healthy kind of fear that we are to have toward God. And number three, an unhealthy kind of fear that we can have toward God. So let's start with the first point, different types of fear. If we're going to understand what kind of fear we're needing to have, we certainly need to understand the different types of fear. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary gives us different meanings for the word fear. From Merriam-Webster Online at merriam we can see at least three different definitions here. The first definition of fear is frighten. You understand what it means to be frightened. Some things have frightened you or scared you. Another definition is to have a reverential awe of, such as fearing God to have a reverence and an awesome feeling toward God. That is another definition of fear. A third definition is to be afraid of or to expect with alarm. This is fearing the worst, for example, knowing something is going to happen, expecting it, and not looking forward to it. Well, let's think about the first definition, to frighten. This is where you have fear because you did not know something was going to happen. Someone may have jumped out from a corner to say boo and scared you, or maybe you were opening a drink and it exploded or a balloon popped. Something happened that frightened you because you did not know it was going to happen. Well, God does not want us to have this type of fear toward him. Let's take a look at the book of Acts chapter 14. If we turn over to Acts chapter 14, let's read verse 17. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. God does not want us to all of a sudden die and meet him and say, Oh, I didn't know you existed. I didn't know that you were real. I just thought you were a myth. God has always left witness in that creation around us in the natural design that we can see in nature. 
Just the idea that we are here and we have something shows us that something must have existed forever. If we go back in time far enough and we have nothing, then we would have nothing now. Therefore, something must be eternal. Something must have existed forever. And God says, that is me. Let's look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. There we read, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God has left witness in the creation, and the power and his intelligence can be seen in the creation and understood by the things that have been made, such as us. And we can stand before God knowing that he existed. God does not want us to all of a sudden meet God and then be frightened because we didn't know we were going to meet God and didn't even realize or believe that he existed. God has left us evidence so that we would not be afraid because we did not know something was going to happen. Another definition of fear is to be afraid of or expect with alarm. This is where you have fear because you know what is going to happen. Another word for that we might use is dread. Some people say, well, I dread going to the dentist. What are they saying? I have a fear of going to the dentist because I know what's going to happen. He's going to get that drill out and it's going to hurt and, and all kinds of painful things are going to happen. Well, that's fear. That's dread. That's saying I know what's going to happen and that's why I fear. Well, God certainly does not wish us to have this type of fear towards him either. Let's take a look at the book of Romans, chapter 8, and read verse 32. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. There we see, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God has loved us and loved us so much that he offered his only son as a sacrifice for us. How would he not give us what we need if we will follow him? How will he not give us an eternal home in heaven if we will obey his commands? There is no need to have dread or fear in meeting God. In fact, those that are Christians can look forward to it without fear and without alarm, knowing that if they are in the family of God, it will be like going home because they will get to meet the Father. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 4. Let's read that verse as well. Revelation 15 and verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. We want to have the correct kind of fear the healthy kind of fear, not the one that is afraid to approach God, afraid to be in his presence, a dread to know that one day you will have to meet your God. But instead, we want to be able to come and worship before him, approach him, approach him with gladness and with thanksgiving and with a happy attitude. God certainly does not wish us to have this type of fear towards him. So if God does not want us to be afraid of him because we did not know he was there or did not know something will happen. And God does not want us to fear him because we know we will meet him and we dread meeting him. What kind of fear does God want us to have? Well, of course, the other definition that we read of fear would certainly be applicable here. A healthy kind of fear toward God is what we are looking at next. The third definition is the correct one that we want to have toward God, to have a reverential awe of. We want to reverence God and be in awe because of him. That's what the word fear can also mean. Let's take a look at the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. There we read in the final two verses of the book, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Here Solomon the writer says that the whole duty of man, or 
the word duty is actually put there by the translators. If we read it more like the original, it might say, for this is the whole of man. This is what man is all about. And what is that? Fearing God and keeping his commandments. And again, what kind of fear is that? It's not to be afraid of him. I can't keep God's commandments very well if I'm afraid to get near him or afraid to even read what he has to say. I certainly can't keep God's commandments if I don't even know he's there, and I have a fear that surprises me that he even had commandments in the first place. Instead, I can keep God's commandments if I have a reverential awe of God, if I have a fear that reverences God and respects him and, and recognizes his power and his majesty. Then I can say, yes, my master, my king, I will love you, and keep your commandments. That is a healthy kind of fear to have toward God. God tells us that we are to fear him. As we heard in our opening text, we are to fear the one who can destroy body and cast the soul into hell, instead of fearing the ones who can only kill the body. So God does want us to fear him, but in a way that reverences him, that shows him the proper respect. We might liken it to our own earthly father. I didn't fear my father in a sense that I was afraid and didn't even know that he existed. All of a sudden, my dad says, hello, and I, I scream because I didn't even know I had a dad. No, that's not true. I also was not afraid of my dad because I dreaded being near him and saying, oh, I don't want to go in that room. Dad is in that room. I can't go in there. No, I didn't have that kind of fear of my dad. But sometimes I had a reverence and a respect, especially if I was in trouble. If my father was upset at me because I did something wrong, then I had a fear, a reverence and a respect to saying, he's the authority figure. He is right. I need to do what is correct. And even today, you might say I have a reverence toward my earthly father, that I fear him in the sense that I respect him and I give him reverence because he deserves it. Well, I mentioned getting in trouble. We've all been afraid, perhaps, when we get in trouble. And in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, when we read about Adam and Eve, they got into trouble as well because they disobeyed God and they sinned by taking of the fruit that they were not supposed to eat. In Genesis, chapter 3, let's read verses 9 and 10. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Well, it's certainly natural to fear God when we know we have sinned against him. And here Adam expresses that very thought, that very idea. I was afraid because I knew that I was in the wrong. Let's also look at Luke 23. Luke chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 39 through 40. Luke 23, 39 through 40. Here Jesus is on the cross and he has two other people next to him who are also being crucified. And one of the malefactors, or criminals, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Well, that was a very good question. Do you not even fear God? Do you not even have a respect or reverence to him? Here you are being crucified because you're a criminal. And here you are acting as if you're, you know, all important or all holy and all perfect. Look at where you are. Do you not fear God? It's natural to fear God when we know we have sinned against him. To have a reverence for that authority and to realize we may be in some trouble if we don't take care of this. We may experience the same kind of fear, that reverence and respect in our daily life that helps keep us out of trouble. Do you see, when we have a little bit of fear, the healthy kind of fear, not the dread that we can't approach God or the fear that doesn't even know God exists, but if we have a healthy dose of fear, a reverence and a respect, that can actually help keep us out of trouble. Maybe you drive down the street and you see a police car and you start to apply the brakes. What made you do that? Maybe you said, oh, wait, maybe I'm going too fast. Maybe I need to slow down. Why? Because you saw that police car and knew that you had a little bit of fear, a little bit of reverence and respect. There's the authority. I need to be careful because the authority is watching. 
Well, God wishes us to fear him not in terror, but in reverence and respect. Psalm 111 verse 9 says, Holy and reverend is his name. God should be reverenced and respected. And God will have mercy on those that choose to fear him. Let's take a look at the book of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and let's read verse 50. There we read, His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. If we fear God in the sense that we have reverence and respect for him as the authority, and we obey his commands, he has mercy upon us. He is pleased when we obey him. And this healthy fear can make us, as Christians, do what is right. If we remember God is watching, we will answer to him one day for what we do. You know, if we remember the police could always be watching, we'll drive like we're supposed to drive every day. Or if we just remember that God is watching every day, maybe that will help us remember to drive like we're supposed to drive every day and to live like we're supposed to live every day and try to do the right kind of living. We know that God deserves and demands reverence that we can show him by what we do and say. So this healthy fear can make us do what is right. If we remember God is watching, I want to reverence him and respect him, and I don't want to fall into his hands because I've done something wrong. I should do what is right, and he will be happy, and I will be happy. Let's take a look at several verses real quick as we think about this idea of healthy fear making us as Christians do what is right. Acts chapter 5 and verse 5. Let's look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 5. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They came to give money to help the poor, but the problem was they lied about it. They lied about how much they had earned by selling their land. When Peter says that you have lied, he says you have lied and you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And in verse 5, Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. In other words, he died. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Why did those people have fear? Because they saw when someone did wrong that they were punished. And that was the kind of reverential respect that they were going to have in order to make sure they did right. They didn't have to dread knowing that something bad is definitely going to happen and you just have to live with it. No, they said, that could happen, but I can avoid it if I have respect for God and his authority. I have a reverence and a respect, and that's going to keep me out of trouble. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. If we remember that God is watching and we understand his laws, will not we then treat other people in the proper way? Submitting ourselves, humbling ourselves, and trying to do what is right? How about the book of Hebrews? Let's turn over there. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 19. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Well, what's being referenced here is the Israelites. They did not believe that they could go into the promised land and take it over, even though God was on their side. So instead, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And the writer here is saying, so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear. Let us therefore have a reverence and a respect for God, unless something should happen that we're not able to enter into our land of rest, which is heaven. Let us take care, take caution. That's what this healthy kind of fear is. It's a healthy kind of fear that says there's danger, there's caution if we do wrong. So therefore, let us have reverence and respect for this powerful, awesome God and, and do what he wants us to do because it's for our own good. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's turn over to chapter 11 and look at verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah moved with fear, because God told him, 
Noah, there's going to be a flood, and you're going to be destroyed unless you listen to my commands and obey and build an ark that you and your household can be saved. So Noah said, sounds like a good idea. I'm going to build this ark. I'm going to respect the authority of God, and I'm going to do what he says, and that will save me. And it did. What if Noah had not had a reverence and a respect for what God said and just said, yeah, whatever, sure, then he would have been destroyed. He knew something bad was coming, but when we obey God, God gives us something good and says, here's a way that you can be saved. Noah had respect for that, and he was saved. How about Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do we obey only when someone is watching, or do we obey all the time? That's an important question. How do you act when someone is not around? How do you behave when you know you are alone? Well, in reality, we're never alone because God is always watching. So we should use that healthy kind of fear to say, I need to be trying to do what is right. When it comes to the other types of fear, the dread, God has actually relieved us of a lot of that dread. You know, when we sin and we realize we sin, we could dread because we say, I, I'm doomed. I've sinned and I deserve the punishment of hell. I deserve eternal separation from God. But God, if we obey his commandments, will actually save us, and that type of fear and dread can be relieved, that, that can be removed. He has offered salvation from the dread of knowing that we are destined for eternal separation from him in hell. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God was willing to adopt us into his family and make us one of his own children. And we can approach God on a personal kind of basis and say, Abba, Father. That relieves us of the dread. That relieves us of the fear and instead replaces it with a comfort knowing that we can be considered a child of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Think of the love that God gives, that we do not have to have a dread anymore of what would happen after this life. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. As we read in the early part of the lesson, we don't have to fear those who may only be able to kill or hurt the body. Instead, we should have a reverence and a respect for the one who can not only kill our body, but separate us into an eternal hell. But if we are a child of God, we can say, The Lord is my helper, and I don't have to fear what man can do to me. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, of course, we also read, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's the comfort that we can have, and a relief from the fear that is dread. Let's, while we're here in Hebrews, let's turn to chapter 12 and read verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. How did Jesus overcome the dread of going to the cross? You know, if you want to talk about someone who dreaded something, that was an example of dread. Jesus did not look forward to the pain and the suffering that was going to happen on the cross. Yes, he was willing to do it. He was willing to submit to the Father. But I know that he wasn't looking forward to it because he prayed in the garden, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But how did he overcome that dread? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus looked for the joy that would come later, and that's what allowed him to endure the cross. That's exactly what we can do in our Christian life. Instead of fearing and dreading what can happen after this life, 
God has allowed his children to look forward to the joy that's set before them, and that allows them to endure what they have to go through on this earth. You know, if we were to have an unhealthy kind of fear toward God, it would be this dreadful fear, the one that causes us to be timid or not take action. When fear causes us not to take action, we're in danger of condemning ourselves. Let's take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 21 and starting in verse 7. Revelation 21, starting in verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Did you notice that the fearful are listed among those list of horrible, evil things? When the fear, the dread, causes us to be timid and not take action and do what we need to do, we can end up not obeying God. We can end up being cowards and not doing what needs to be done. And if we don't obey God and his commandments, then we will have a reason to dread and to fear what happens to us after this life. A healthy kind of fear reverences God as the authority, respects him as good, and keeps us remembering that we need to obey God because one day we will answer him. And that day for the Christian will be a great day. For those who are not Christians or who are not faithful, that is a day they should dread and do something about it now while they have the time to turn that dread into joy. Jesus once told the Jews in John 8.32, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How can we continue in the word? How can we know the truth? We invite you to visit us at truthfortheworld.org. Bible courses, TV and radio programs, tracts and articles on common biblical questions are all available at truthfortheworld.org. Come hear the Bible. Come hear the truth. truthfortheworld.org If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia. 30096 the United States of America or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org day by day and with each passing moment strength i find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Truth for the World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with Churches of Christ throughout the world.